body just because, or a little bit more, a little more dramatically, let's say, because we're going into or through or dealing with an emotional issue, like a loss or mental discursiveness, and, you know, or maybe a blend of both, you know. And so that's when we can often really have heightened awareness of the body, um, which means that it usually comes after something happens, usually not before. So learning how to be in the body more and more of the time is actually a learning. It's a, it, we, are, we cultivate it. It's not natural. I mean, maybe it is when we were little. But then when our ego mind takes over and our, our perceptions take hold, then we're less and less in the body and we're more and more in the mind. And that's, so that's absolutely natural, and there's no reason to feel embarrassed or behind on that. <laughs> the good news is that we can change that, you know. And so this morning, today, what I'm hoping to do is guide you t through some different practices and then frame them with Dharma and with some quotes uh, to offer a little bit of direct experience and then a little bit of, of uh, my experience, your direct experience, my experience in the past, and then uh, maybe some other uh, relevant and, and interesting Dharma teachers that you hadn't heard of before, or at least talking about this subject. Um, because it's still not a very well-mined subject, honestly. I want to talk about the body, not a lot about, not a lot of being in the body yet. So I'm glad that you're here to experiment with this. And um, yeah. So is, uh, is anybody new to um, practice? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay, great. And so was it the topic that interested you? Yeah, the topic and my brother has like recommended and I'm here visiting. Oh, great. Just in. Where are you visiting from? Um, I'm in Reno, Nevada. I'm going to Reno, Nevada. Oh, excellent. Okay. I know a really good guy in Reno that I can connect you with. You. Um, yeah, that's great. Anybody else? Is, yeah, hi. Hi. Um, I'm Araceli. I, I just I want to explore a little bit more. Uh -huh. and, I don't know, just caught, caught me things, you know. I was like, I want to try it. I had never tried meditation before. So you have not? Okay. That's excellent. I appreciate the trust. I hope I don't blow it. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to say why they came? Yeah. I will. I feel like there's so many times that even though I try being my body, it, I, I don't know what it's really telling. So yeah, 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 I can yeah. feel some things, but I haven't developed the finer um, you know, intuition or communication with it to really right. get it. Yeah, anybody else relate? Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny how we could spend all this time in this you know, form and uh, not really be in it. <laughs> not as well as we could. But that's always the good news, I think, is that it's, uh, you know, it's part of being on the Dharma path. And, you know, really learning from what the Buddha taught is that things are learned, they're cultivated. We condition or we decondition. We decondition so the conditioning that isn't so helpful. We condition things that are more helpful. That's how the minds work. But in order, our minds work, in order to do, to get anything implanted, let's say, or embodied, or fully embraced. It has to be repetitive. It has to be done over and over and over again. I think that's partially why, um, in my experience, there are less of us than more of us. Because it requires a little bit of patience, uh, some kindness, which can also be cultivated. So if you don't have a, like an amazing relationship with yourself yet, you can. But it requires some kindness. And just doing something over and over again that you believe in or trust or um, have experience is helpful, right? 
So I'm a very firm believer in direct experience, which I mentioned a little while ago. Um, I'm going to offer you ways to be in your body, possibly some ways to imagine being in your body. And you may have an, an entirely different image or way or experience than what I'm suggesting, and that's great. Because we're all wires in a different way. You know? So if I say, picture this to be red, and it comes up green, and I won't do it, it won't be that flaming, but uh, if, if your image of something comes up green, that's excellent, then you follow that. Because we do have this real basic, beautiful intuition and instinct, and our imagination, which we all have, will guide us into what is true. <clears throat> so just go with it, at least, if you can, for something comes up and it's an image or some sensations that aren't exactly as I'm um, suggesting. You know what I'm doing is I'm suggesting I'm just going to try to walk you through some landscape, and your landscape will be different than mine or perhaps anyone else's, and that's we need to relish in that. We need to give ourselves permission. Like real permission to experience what we're experiencing without doubt. Doubt ruins the whole thing. I think it gets in the way. So um, that's also that kind of belief in oneself is cultivated. <laughs> but I think worthy of, of saying something. Something I'm really interested to explore today is <coughs> just for people oh, right. Yeah. Oh, they can hear okay. 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 Driven. And so building a, a deeper state of awareness during those emotionally driven inflection points. Um, yeah, I think that would be a great skill set to like practice. If they are being driven by emotional states, you mean you want to know that that's the case? Uh, I, I intuitively sense that is the case, so more so like being able to be aware and have skillful means to adapt when you're in those inflections. So it doesn't ah, kind yeah, of yeah. go to the polarized extreme from like right. peaceful to more activated. And kind of like, yeah. I think creating more equanimity <coughs> throughout life and not just in practice. So right, okay. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Dave, no. We were just on retreat together. So there, there, is, there are little part places that we can track in the mind, little places that we can stop, pause, and change the trajectory. So that, this might apply to what you're saying. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. So just one thought to share that's kind of went through me in this condition that I'm having. I have been, um, and it relates to the distinction you mentioned, sort of the relationship between mind and body, and I've been dealing with an illness for the last couple of years, and what always struck me is strength is that on the one hand, your mind is kind of having a, a dialogue, a conversation with your body about the illness, about how to process it, about how to overcome it. But even while that conversation is happening, there's another more Buddhist voice in me, which is saying, you're actually talking to yourself. <laughs> this actually is all you talking to you. This isn't actually two things talking to each other and yet it feels like it is yeah but I on some gut level I'm like it's not I, I don't know where to go with that but when I think of the mind and the body as distinct things it Are they? feels like they're not really yet there's no other mechanism to have to explore it without treating them like they are even though you know it's not really real huh. I don't know if that makes Exactly. Well, it, it's, I think it does, and I think we can explore that in the way of just sensing. So let's see. 
you know, and you can, you can relate back to me. Let's try. Uh, I'm certainly familiar with having a body that's not allowed. So, yeah, that can feel like a dichotomy, but that doesn't have to be. That's great. Sorry, I'm too drunk. We actually can't hear that well. So, from now on, give people Sorry, guys. That's my bad. Um, and, or, you know, if it's a good comment, you could repeat it. Okay. Thank you. Well, let's move into practice. And, uh, and then we can uh, open into forum. I do appreciate conversation. You know, I think we learn from each other so much from our own experiences and uh, feel free to um, disagree if you need to with me. Just please be kind about it. <laughs> no, but I, I do, I like conversation and I think uh, our minds are also interesting and unique and yet very, very similar. So um, let's see what we can do. In the next 20 minutes, we'll just start with a shorter practice, which that's relative. Uh, I'll guide you a little and then I'll allow you to have some silence. Is everybody on the right chair, cushion configuration? So welcome to move if you want. There's more cushions. We can pull them out of the time. I'm going to time this because I lose track of time. You're welcome to close your eyes completely if you like. You're also welcome to cast your gaze uh, softly down, but have the gaze fairly wide, not directed at any one thing in particular. What we notice when we turn inwardly at first are a variety of things. Be an active mind, a heart that's talking to us, a body that isn't quite comfortable yet. So I'd like to offer you some suggestions of ways that you can maybe drop in and settle. And some things to try, see if it makes a difference. So let's begin by noticing the weight of the bones in our body. Maybe draw your attention to the ones that feel the heaviest first. And then to some others that might not be as heavy, but you can still sense or feel weight. Also know that gravity is doing this, so it's the weight of the bones, but gravity is holding us here. And either through the aspect of allowing weight, allowing ourselves to really feel our own weight, or gravity, so you can invite the soft tissue muscles, fascia, whatever it is that you can imagine or sense to release because they're actually recognizing the weight. So perhaps you feel a settling and contact with your chair or cushion or floor, whatever you're on, feet. We 
And if you can, allow the contact points to be connection points also. So it's as if you're rooting yourself logistically or just even through sensing that feeling contact leading to connection. And then see if you can notice the weight of your eyes. Maybe even invite your eyes to sink a little bit more deeply into your skull. So there, it's as if they're moving towards the back, the f just relaxing. The eyelids just so very, very softly and subtly drape over them. And if your eyes are somewhat open, same thing, just not fully closed. Sometimes there's a suggestion to turn to look towards the back of the skull. See if that creates any kind of shift or change in how you feel. And see if you can relax the skin of your face. Almost like somebody's got your ears and just very gently pulling your ears back. So the skin widens. Maybe you can allow your lips to plump up a little bit. Not press them together if they are. And then see if you can soften the root of your tongue. So the tongue is in the mouth, but it also falls down the throat. If that can be invited and you feel it, see if that connects to anything else in your body. So relaxing the tongue in the mouth, relaxing the root of the tongue, has a variety of connections. Can you notice anything? If you can, allow your shoulders, your shoulder blades to roll down your back like little waterfalls. Let your arms hang. And feel whatever your hands are touching. Just go there for a moment and notice contact, connection, hands to leg, hands to hand, whatever it is. Your hands being held by the air. Maybe you can even notice the very subtle but palpable weight of the fingernails. Relax your belly as much as you can. Just let it hang. And then if you're comfortable with it, you can just allow your kind awareness to be invited wherever your body 
Just talking to it. Come on over here. Feel me over here. Or you can choose to stay in one place that could be more comfortable, could be a better anchor for you, like noticing the breath somewhere. Staying with contact points. Or even listening to sound that's more helpful. So either invite yourself to just travel anywhere the body gets a sensation here or there, notice it, and then wait for the next. Or stay in one place in the body that is comfortable for you, feels okay. Or follow your breath. Or simply receive sounds. Choose one. And when you get pulled into thinking or planning or remembering, <coughs> see if you can feel where that affects your body or how it may have affected your breath. Reduced to this polite touch. So that association might be apparent. And then just go back to whatever it was that you were. Focusing on is your anchor.
to bring yourself back to one of those initial touch points that I referenced. Maybe weight of your bones. Let the eyes sink into the skull. Relaxing the root of the tongue. Softening the belly. Just to remind yourself of those areas. And what they feel like when you actually do release. Or linger there for a moment. If you'd like to take a breath that's a little deeper, or just even more conscious, that's great. And allow your eyes to lift open slowly. Please do, and as your eyes are open, see if you can receive sight rather than rush towards it. Just start gentle. Before you do any kind of movement that sort of shakes up the jar, notice how you are, how you feel, what you are, can be aware of with your eyes open and your body relatively still. With your eyes open, taking in what's going on around us, but so probably a little bit more aware of what's going on internally as well. This is inner and outer awareness. And then if you'd like to move, stand up, stretch, that's absolutely fine. So some of the uh, areas that we, that I invited you to maybe sense or uh, relax, let's say, um, a lot of those points or places are um, associated with the vagal nerve, um, which I find interesting because a lot of times People will say we need to manipulate the nerve, like you can manipulate your vagal nerve with your neck, you know, by massaging your neck, or the occiput, the two little bones in the back of the skull. You know, there's a variety of places because it's long, it goes from the cranium all the way down. Um, there are different areas where we might sense that it gets tight and we can literally um, palpate it or massage it and open it up. What I find interesting is that we don't have to touch it sometimes. You know, yeah, this helps. I do this all the time. But by using my imagination, for instance, and um, letting my eyes sink deeply into the skull, that has the same effect. The pulling of the ears is one of the vagal uh, places that you can manipulate with your fingers. But by imagining that your ears were being pulled back, 
actually even imagining that your ear canals open up. I know that sounds a little strange. But we can do this. So we can try at least. Be open to it. Um, the root of the tongue. You might have sensed that one. That's a, a, a nice area to release. It actually can release all the way down to the pelvic floor, where the connection is all the way down to the pelvic floor. So there's lots of things that we can invite ourselves to do um, through concentration, really. So we focused on these areas, you know, the ones that you could or you wanted to, and maybe you sense something. Isn't that cool? Because that gives us agency. And that's the mind-body connection, because there is no dissection. And the Buddha always talked about nama rupa, which literally translates as mind-body. But another, I think, interesting translation is mentality, so mental formations, and materiality, material formations. But they're the same, it's just a different arrangement, you know? It's just a different arrangement. Maybe it's different particles bumping into each other differently. But they're constantly, the mind body is constantly communicating whether we know it or not. Um, generally, we ignore the communication until it becomes more extreme or acute or unpleasant, let's just say unpleasant, or maybe even really pleasant. You know, it's like, oh, I like this body feeling right now. But generally during our waking hours, we're not paying that much attention to it. But having these checkpoints uh, moving into the body, it's almost like a body scan, right? But with suggestions, there's lots of ways to do body scans, can be a way to start to balance the central nervous system. So the parasympathetic, sympathetic nervous system begins to feel a little bit more in accord rather than discord. And when the nervous system is a little bit more balanced, one of the greatest aspects of that is connection. We feel connected. We feel connected to ourselves, but we also feel connected to each other. So when the nervous system is imbalanced, when the vagal nerve is tight somewhere and it's off, that's isolation. That, that allow, gives us the feeling of separation. So anything that we can do to open the nervous system, to release the vagal nerve, to relax the body, has a huge effect on the mind and the heart. So it's not just a one-way street, it's a two-way street, and it's, you know, depends on what's going on, which door we enter into. But I just wanted to give you a little I'll just tell you a little bit about why I touched into those particular places in case you want to do it again. Because I think if we have information and it makes sense to us, then we'll try it. And I think if something works a little bit, then you might want to try it again. And then it's yours. It's not just hearsay, it's not just in a book, it's not just because someone else told you. So the body actually feels it's sensing. It's almost like we have our eyes closed and we're just kind of like this. <laughs> the body is sensing things before the mind cognizes it. Now, that's not what we notice unless we've trained ourselves. And it's totally possible. Kind of like what you were, you know, wanting to know that it wears that, what you call it, an intersection or inflection, inflection point. Yeah. So, once we develop a little bit more sense of our own bodies and we're living in it, so the head is actually on top of the body, the mind, head, whatever you want to think of it as. I know they're two different things. But you know, usually when we're walking, our mind is at the place that we're going. We do that driving all the time. It's a little scary. But if the mind, head is on the body, we're in the present, in the body, in sync. It's a really interesting feeling. I mean, and it's like, oh, ho, oh, hum, big deal. It is a big deal. Because <laughs> it means we're right here. If we can be in the body 
as it's doing whatever it's doing, it ch it'll change your, the way you live, really. Because we're more aware of sensing rather than thinking. Because if we're, well, you know, a little tilted towards thinking, which most of us are, I mean, I, I really like my mind, I think a lot. <laughs> but I also sense as well, so having a balance is really great. Because if we're in the thinking mind all the time, or analyzing, or projecting, or remembering, you know, thinking mind, then um, we're not here. And I think a lot of us come to practice, especially Dharma practice, to be present. So this is a way that we can uh, start cultivating being more present, is to be in the body. And it was never mind only in terms of how the Buddha taught. He emphasized the body over and over and over again in lots of different ways. But I think our cultures generally have just gone more into mind only practices. Okay. We can change that. What can be also quite interesting is that we're literally relating to the relative aspect of awareness and the absolute aspect of awareness. Are you familiar with that? So the relative aspect of awareness or, or consciousness is how we think and feel about things. It's our personal um, interpretation. That includes our opinions, our perceptions, our likes, our, our dislikes, etc. Um, how we identify ourselves, all included in relative. I mean, you know, to get along, it's good to have a name, have some money so you can pay your rent, you know, maybe vote, things like that. But um, so to get along in the world, we need certain. We need to identify ourselves in certain ways. That's how we communicate with each other, that's how we do things. But in the absolute sense of the world or reality, let's say, um, we're much more than how we identify with ourselves, right? We are not what we identify ourselves as. We're constantly, just like all of nature, shifting, changing, and rearranging. There's nothing permanent about us at all. We think there is. We believe there is, and sometimes we need to believe there is. So I'm not saying that's terrible, but we want to know that there's both of those views, that the portal can narrow a little when we need to be. I need to take care of myself, for instance. And the portal can widen and say, and be like, it's a body, it's getting older. I don't need to take that personally. We're going to take the world personally. And then we do. And then we know we can widen the experience again, maybe open our awareness again, let go. So one of the ways that we can feel how we sort of cycle in and out of those states in a way, or understandings or recognition of relative and absolute, is in the body. And one of the ways that we can um, pause ourselves from going into too much relative view. So you know we can do that, right? Is when we start to sense the body shifting and changing. So you guys heard about this, it's, it's called feeling tone. You know, feeling tone is generally sensing what's pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Neutral is a little bit harder for most of us to feel. So let's just stay with pleasant or unpleasant for a second. When we're sensing something pleasant, like a sound, or a sight, or a taste, or a sensation even, or even a thought, or an emotion, you know, the body generally releases somewhat. When we're sensing something that's unpleasant, a sound, a sight, a taste, a smell, a sensation, a thought, a feeling, an emotion, 
the body generally contracts. Now, it may not be completely obvious because we, the body has these kind of like really interesting, almost sneaky little ways of doing something that we just don't feel. <laughs> like it'll be tiny. So if we're not aware of the subtle shifts in the body, like places that it might be contracting or tightening when it's happening, that means we've over-identified or identified or something. We're on our way to having lots of thoughts and feelings about them, perceptions. We're identifying. But if we can catch that tiny little bit of time, and it's not easy, but it's doable, where we're sensing something, oh, it's pleasant. But let me use unpleasant, because we generally we have negativity bias, so we pay more attention to that anyway. Oh, this is unpleasant. And this is what I sort of lightly suggested in the practice. If you can sense a thought or an emotion, let's say, or even a sensation that's unpleasant or uncomfortable, couldn't be a memory, and you know, drop down into your body and you feel where the body's shifted, contracted, tightened, and you're on your way to knowing what your body does in those situations. Now, don't move around. It's not always going to be the same place. But if you don't pay attention to the body, then the mind just goes whoop. The, the, the probably overused but understandable metaphor is we get on the train and we have to go to the very end. Um, Ajahn Amro, my primary teacher, said, quoted a David Bowie song and said, you know, why am I always crashing in the same car? That's what we do. We get habitualized to not sensing, or to identifying for me, it's called sometimes. And then we're off and running, and usually we end up in the same place, which is um, not so fun. Um, be a little light about it, but it's what harming is about. Now, self-harm doesn't have to be this huge violent act. You know, it's like trauma. It can be very small, it can be very big. And you know, we run the nuance, we run the gamut, each of us, in our lives. Um, but self-harm means, in this context, that we're doing things over and over and over again, even though it leads us to the same place. We're crashing the same, crashing, getting the same car, crashing over and over again. We know how we do that. So one inflection point is Vedna, or feeling tone. Because if we can just sense pleasant, unpleasant, and keep it there, rather than, I like it, I want more. I don't like it, how do I get rid of it? Oh, this happened to me before. Oh gosh, it's gonna happen again. All the proliferating, did I say that right? Proliferating thoughts, the pancha is called it. Holly, all the discursive thinking and the feelings that can get out of control are gonna start like that. So it's a tiny little window. It's a little what's called break in the chain of dependent origination, if you know anything about that, that we can start to sense if we're in our bodies more and more at a time. Maybe not always, not like always. Maybe if you're enlightened. I, I, I honestly don't know about that. I'm not trying to be uh, humble. But I know that I can start to sense the shifts in my body tissue more easily more of the time. And then I can do something. I can uh, pull out a skillful means, <laughs> which I'll share with you some. Uh, um, you know, in the moment and stop the traje trajectory. The other thing that we'll start to notice, and I'm going to uh, we'll do a practice for this too, is um, we can notice the shift in breath. I mean, that seems kind of obvious, doesn't it? <clears throat> like, where are you breathing when you're upset? Hi, yeah. Or does anybody hold their breath when they're upset? And when you're relaxed and having a nice time, can you do you notice where you're breathing? No, 
want us to good things. <laughs> we need to pay attention to goodness as much as we do what's not working the way we want. Um, but usually, when we're feeling relaxed, like maybe after that first meditation, and again, that's relative, that might not have been a pleasant meditation for you at all. It doesn't have to be. But we can sense that there's this feeling of um, weight being grounded. It's not for naught that the Buddha touched the earth as his witness. So we're literally touching the earth, we feel it a little more. We're in our bodies, we're grounded. And generally speaking, the breath will be a little lower. Generally. We can learn to bring it lower, or we just notice what it is. Notice the conditions that take the breath up. So the breath is a mirror to the mind and heart. Always, always responding. Always responding. Now it's quite subtle, but we can learn to not just concentrate on it in meditation, which is helpful, but we can learn to be more aware of it during the day, which I think is important. Really because, you know, why do we want to do a practice that stays on a cushion or in a, a particular place? We want to walk it out. Right. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions before? Um, can you talk more about the Vegas here? Oh, wait. Um, could you talk more about the Vegas nerve and what are the points that we should be concentrating on during meditation to you know, massage it into Yeah. Well, I would suggest the ones that I talked you through, but there's. Um, Could you repeat that again? No, yeah, sure. So, was the, was the eyes, eyes, relaxing the eyes into the back of the skull, releasing the face, so all the facial muscles are connected to the nerve. I suggested pulling the ears back. The ear canal, ear area, has a connection. Just imagine that, right? Yeah. Widening the face, relaxing the lips, mm -hmm. softening the tongue and the root of the tongue, letting the shoulders fall down your back, relaxing the belly, feeling the weight. Those are the those are the places I think are most helpful for me. But if you Google it, you're going to find lots and lots of suggestions. Um, there's a wonderful uh, monastic named Ajahn Suchito, and he talks about uh, somatics all the time. I mean, he's really body-based. He's also an artist, which is why I mean I am too. So I think you know I kind of get his imagery. But um, I don't know if I brought it, but he 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 talks about how the nervous system is really what we're connecting to. And if we can calm the nervous system or release the nervous system, then we're opening the mind and heart, you know, that we're releasing shitta. Um, I'm not sure if I brought that particular quote, but anyway, he talks about it, uh, the importance of releasing or, you know, soothing the nervous system. The vagal nerve is just one way. There's breathing practices and things we can do too, which I'd like to uh, share with you because the breathing practices in um, some of the more traditional Dharma contexts, like the, the Thai Forest Monastery, is it exactly like it is in the yogic tradition from India? And it could be also quite different from the um, uh, Tantra tradition of. Tibet. So there's lots of different ways to do things. You know, none is right, none is better. Well, what's better is what works for us. <laughs> so, you know, um, yeah. So that's why it's nice, I think, to try uh, different different things. I'm just thinking. Yeah. Okay. So. This is relatively about the um, nervous system. This is from um, a 
piece called Breathing Intelligence from Ajahn Suchito. So he's talking about chitta, which can translate as heart or heart mind. But chitta, I think what's interesting about chitta, it's always with us. I mean, it's part of us, right? And it doesn't have any boundaries. So, for instance, we sense chitta in the body, but it's not just contained in the body. It's just like consciousness. We can sense consciousness, but where does it end? It does. Um, so here he's talking about breath and how it moves through the body and regulates emotions and energy. So he talks a lot about energies. I talk a lot about energies. Energies are not woo-woo. They're just not seen. Um, he says breathing has an intelligence to it. It changes in response to fear, tension, and trust. It's an embodied intelligence. It doesn't tell us about things. It directly experiences and responds to emotional states, psychologies, and attitudes as they play out in the stirring tension and releases of our bodies. So this is where I think it can, I just want to stop for a second and, and say something about that little paragraph because we're very habitualized, conditioned to wanting to figure out things through words or analysis, you know, through, through thinking, through concept. And the body doesn't have to be understood that way. In fact, it's probably more fruitful if we don't. Now, we will make associations, like, oh, I'm thinking this, and so I feel this like this in my body. Or I'm feeling my heart is broken, so I'm noticing this in my breath. Those associations are strong and usually obvious. But do we have to put a word to everything that we're sensing? No. So the wordless language of the body is sensation. You want to name it, label it, cool, hot, etc. You can. But I think what is more, in my opinion, what's ultimately more um, helpful is not to name it, but get to know its, uh, to, to just sense it, to know it as sensations, pure sensations. And you'll start to know, oh, well, those sensations or groups of sensations happen when I'm feeling like this, just over time, whatever we observe, we get to know. So as an obvious point, like when we're about to give a talk in front of hundreds of people, well, if anybody does, never mind, that's probably not great. <laughs> um, when, we, when we're new in town and we're coming to, going into a party, we don't know anyone. You know that feeling. Um, there are certain sensations that will accompany that. Now, they may not just be as you walk into a party and you don't know anyone. They could also happen when you see a dog coming down the street that you know, you're know you a little afraid of. Or, I don't know, you hear a car and you think it's coming you know, too close. So it's a response, a group of sensations that are a response to certain feelings. Um, does that make sense? I don't want to formulate it too deeply for you, but because it's, you know, if we say, oh, well, this means this and that means that, if I, I don't do that because it overlays what you might experience. You know, if you learn something, oh, it's this color, it's in this area of your body, this means this, before you've experienced it, then if your experience is different, you're going to be like, oh, maybe I don't get it. It overlays, it conceptually overlays our experience and keeps us from having our own direct experience. So I'm a little abstract, but I think hopefully you've got what I meant. Um, so to go on with Ajahn uh, Sajito, he said, you know, it's an embodied intelligence. Excuse me. Oops, we'll take a break soon. Um, it doesn't tell us about things. It directly experiences and responds to emotional states, states, psychologies, and attitudes as they play out in the stirring tension and releases of her body. And then he goes on, even more crucially, the enlightenment factors and the four establishments of mindfulness 
are all directly experienced in this breathing body. This is why the Buddha made mindfulness of breath his primary meditation and the only one he gave detailed instructions on. Then he goes on to talk about um, feeling the body con contract or tighten and he's relating this to hindrances. Um, he said, we don't relax into a hindrance. So if you're feeling doubt, for instance, you're not going to relax into doubt. We, just, we hold back from doubt. You know, we tighten if there's doubt, for instance, that's one of the hindrances. So he says, but you can relax down to your legs, into your feet. You can relax through your skin. So when you can feel a tightening, you can relax out into the space around you, which will do relax down, um, down your back. And by doing this, sensing this, you counteract the normal tendency, which is when difficulties start occurring, our inherited psychological psychologies start happening and we get tight to deal with them. Here we go, another habit. So what he's suggesting with breath, and we can do this just with body, you know, it doesn't have to be just breath, but with the body, by touching into the vagal points, by relaxing what we start to sense tense, if we can, in the moment, maybe later, and we suggest this later. But when we do that, guess what? We're breaking the cycle. You can't break the cycle purely in the mind, because the mind is not disconnected from the body. So we have to involve both mind and body to decondition, to break a habit, stop a cycle. Hopefully that's interesting because we can. <laughs> so I'm a forever optimist and I think anytime that we want to connect with or want to learn, we can. It takes, you know, a, a very amount of time, different times sometimes. So let's take, um, you can take a break now or 11.30, I forget. You said 11.30. Okay, so let's keep going. Gosh. Let's practice. <laughs> um, yeah, let's practice a little. I don't like you talking so much. Unless there's a question before we... And online, okay. Um, something that I struggle with often still I think is it on? Do you wake up? It's, it's for the hybrid. It's for the people. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have the fight. Oh. Um, something I still struggle with in my meditations on my longer ones is I feel like when I do attune to my body, um, I tend to get more sleepy. Uh -huh. uh, at least anytime I try to do like longer than 30 minutes. Do you have any tips for still sensing into my body rather than any of the other formations and still kind of staying yeah. alert, I guess? Yeah. Well, I could say a couple things about that. One is that we generally equate relaxation with being tired. And sometimes meditation is talked about as being having a relaxed, open awareness. So we're sort of toggling relaxation with tiredness. We're not toggling it, not falling into the sleepiness, but relaxed yet clear, right? Tense and clear, not so good. Relaxed and clear, yes, very nice. So there are moments when we can start to feel ourselves get a little bit dull. And I would use some pretty simple, skillful means, like taking some breath. You know, there's nothing wrong with taking some deep breath to energize your system and then start again. Or open your eyes if you want to. Those are a couple of really, you know, like easy things to do. It's like adjusting your posture when you feel that you've gotten slumped. And then you start again. But trying to catch that little line is pretty interesting. Yeah, it is. Um, The other thing is that it, we're not really sensing the body so much, and um, it gets boring. Breath can get boring. 
So we have to come up with different ways to keep ourselves interested. Because if we're interested, we stay a little bit more awake. If we're bored, we kind of fell out. And the other thing is that we're addicted to, habituated to, <coughs> conditioned to, find the next new thing. It's called Bhagavad's. It's becoming. I mean, it's anti what we have been brought up as doing, thinking, oh, let me just stay in the present moment, that's great. No, it's like, oh, I need that watch, I want that car, I win this job if I only had this. So we're constantly thinking about what's ahead. We get excited about it, it's dramatic. It also is a good thing, you know, so it's not completely negative, because it keeps us coming up with, with ways to improve things. All inventions are because you thought, someone thought, oh, I could do this better, or why don't I put it together like this? All intentions are about thinking about, oh, well, I'd like to improve this, or I'd like to bring this into my life. So it's not about, you know, not growing, but it is about finding ways to notice when the thinking mind's drama has sort of dropped, and then that makes you tired. Because we like drama. We're just hooked onto it. You know, it's what cleaning is. Does that make sense? I <laughs> one thing, one time, um, my teacher that I will reference a lot, but Ajahn Amaro, he said when he first started practicing, they do these all night visuals, vigils, you know, in the Theravada tradition. And he would put a toothpick between his thumb and his finger so that he could feel when it dropped and then he knew he was getting tired. That's kind of, I think, a little bit extreme. <laughs> That's how he did it, but you know. Good job. At any rate, so those are some suggestions. Thank you. And there was a, there's a question online. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, I have a question. I I'm getting feedback. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm trying to understand where emotion comes in. And I'm wondering if you're using mind as also feeling. Like in my in my experience, there's sort of a level of dropping in and being with sensation and then watching the mind do stories which I know right. I don't want to be in the stories, but then there's also a confusing, feels like middle space to me of identifying emotion and that yeah. that could be part of a story. Oh, I'm lonely or I'm sad or right. um, versus emotion that is actually um, maybe connected to sensation in a healthy way. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think thoughts and emotions are so entangled that sometimes it's interesting to detangle them. If you really want to fine tune what's an emotion, what's a thought, and what do they do? Where do they take me? But generally, they're pretty wound up together. But the, um, the second part of what you just said about emotions being pleasant, is that what you said? Um, um, emotions being healthy, on, as emotions okay, as right. of the drama and the story versus emotions yeah. that might be just very connected to sensation. Yeah, well, I think if we utilize them, they're really good. I mean, without getting caught or hooked, emotions like joy are really good to cultivate. Um, equanimity. Very beautiful to con con uh, cultivate. Um, generosity, um, sympathetic um, happiness. You know, there's lots of the, the seven factors of awakening. Those are, you know, love, kindness, all really, really wonderful things to uh, enlarge, you know, to, to spread. Not that we can live like that all the time, but we want to know what those states feel like, we want to let them grow. And part of that, I think, is part of the interesting aspect of these 
more healthy uh, is the relationship to our own hearts. And our relationship to our own heart is our relationship to all hearts. And so it helps connect us to ourselves, to each other. And generally, we don't pay so much attention to those feelings, those emotions. We feel because of, you know, we pay attention more to the things we don't like. That's the negativity bias. So part of mindfulness and part of Dharma practice is turning towards the goodness and cultivating it. Sometimes as an antidote, like uh, uh, loving kindness can be an antidote to fear or anger, you know. Um, generosity could be an antidote to um, scarcity. So there's lots of ways that we can utilize these wonderful natural attributes that we all have. We have these. But we tend to be like, oh, no, no, uh, yeah. this is more important. I gotta figure this out or change this. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of benefit in paying attention to those, not in the, at the exclusion of what's really happening. Like we don't want to, oh, it's all good and the world isn't all good. It's not a bypass, uh, it's not a skillful means for bypassing, but it's a skillful means for knowing the full array of the human heart. That's how I was, that's probably the best way I can say that for now. And if we feel better, again, not in a you know naive way, but when we feel better and we're more connected to ourselves, we connect to each other. We want to help each other out. It's just natural. You know, we take care of each other. We take care of things. So, um, yeah, that's a good question. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, why don't we, why don't we take a little break now, um, because I don't want to do a shorter meditation because of the time. Um, I'd love to give you some, some time to sink into a practice. Um, so let's take a 15 minute break, is that, is that okay, is that enough time for you? Is that generally okay? <coughs> 15 minutes, yeah? And, um, yeah, and then we'll start again. Yeah, I have you been here before? Yeah, I've been here before. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it's Thai.
point south and point north because my brain is top and point north. So I was going to go back to the point south. It didn't help. It's a decent idea. It's a decent idea. It's a forest tradition. It is. Yeah, you don't have to. No particular idea that comes to mind. Just check it out. Um, my sister said she's got a bunch of books. I'm going to to the reading like a Buddha is more Look at the if you look at the line and go to the Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So uh, I'm going to give you some light guidance to. I'll give you some light guidance to get you going. Just some suggestions, and then I hope I give you enough silence. Um, and again, that's relative because some people will want more silence and some people will want more guidance. Um, but I think it's uh, yeah, it's important for us to explore ourselves without someone talking at us or suggesting. So it'll be a little combination of both and we'll practice for a half hour, just so you know that. Um, so take any posture that your body is okay in right now. something in my suggestions doesn't really feel like it suits you, then um, just slightly push it away. You know, it doesn't have to be a big deal because these are, these are just suggestions. And like I was saying earlier, um, how you experience a suggestion might be very different than the person next to you. And that's, that's okay. So let's start by noticing the space around us. So we're, most of us it looks like are sitting, could be lying down. But see if you can sense the space of the room that you're in. So when we sense it, what I mean is just sort of feel it. You might be able to feel the distance, somewhat anyway, between your front body and the wall in front of you. Or your back body and the wall behind you. Or the space between your head, the top of your head, and the ceiling. See if you can just feel that without looking. If you 
if it's helpful to find your weight, to sense gravity, to put yourself in the room more physically, and you can do that at the same time. So settle as much as you're able to, and then sense the open space around you. Some of the things that you'll be sensing in this space that you're in is the light, the quality of light, brightness, whatever variation on that there is that comes through your eyelids. We also hear sounds. And these sounds, if we receive them, without talking inwardly, talking about them, we're just noticing what's present in and around the space that we're in. And they're dimensional. They come from above to the sides. From below. You might smell something. Notice the scent. Usually that gets a little bit dull once we've been in a place for a little while, but you might be able to sense the scent. Usually we can sense the air in the space that we're in. <coughs> so space holds the air. You can sense it as cool or warm. Maybe there's a breeze. We can sense the difference between the skin that's exposed to the air and the skin that's covered by clothes. You can also sense the air as it enters into your nostrils. What you're noticing is the air in the space that you're in, just very lightly coming into your body. Maybe it's cool. Very lightly being passed back into the space. <coughs> and maybe that feels warm. But we're literally Breathe in air and space. The air is in the space that we're in. So how can you feel that now? Maybe you 
you just sense it in the nostrils, maybe you sense it in the throat. Probably pretty delicate. says this air coming in to your lungs. Maybe you sense the air more on the right side of your body than your left. Or the front or the back. See what you feel. Maybe the air, the breath, which is composed of air and space, is straight up and down, or maybe it's zigzags, maybe it spirals. Maybe it only goes in a little ways. It's quite shallow and whisper-like. Sometimes it can get a little shy when you look at it. It's not sure how to be. So if you can, just step back and let your breath just be however. But notice the subtleties of it as best you can. It's on one side of your throat, more than the other, one nostril, more than the other. Whenever you start to think or have an emotion or thoughts and emotions intertwined, be delighted for a moment because if you can, you'll notice that it changed your breath, that it rearranged the air in your body. So just as an experiment, see if you can sense that. next few minutes. Since not thinking and not feeling and then you will. And that occurs, it's an interesting experiment. What did that just shift in my body or my breath?
now, if you'd like to, you can experiment with this breath, this air, this space. Consider it like a breeze or a wind. And draw it in and take it somewhere. So imagine that you're breathing into a place that feels a little constricted or tight. Or a place that you don't visit very often inside. Or just up and down your back. into your legs, or your hands. So you breathe in the space via the vehicle of air, which turns into breath. You bring that space inside. You long in the breath if it's helpful. Leave it just as it is and imagine it. But an experiment, but it's an experiment, so see what happens. With the kind awareness that you have throughout your body via the vehicle of this wind or breeze or breath, see if you can create a feeling of a little bit more space somewhere.
able to move your, your breath, the wind, the breeze, your kind attention, somewhere in your body. You can also try breathing into that area a little bit more deeply and pausing as if you're holding a bubble and allowing the nutrients of the breath, of the prana, of the chi, the wind or moon, to be absorbed into your body. And then breathe it out. So it's just a small pause, a retention, to allow for the absorption before you bring it out. Very delicate, very light.
imagine letting your body breathe. Almost as if the body is permeable. Breath is coming in, which it is. The breath is coming in through the cells, through the skin, in and out through as much of your somatic experience of your body as possible. sweep through like opening windows in a stale room. Return to whatever expression it's, it would like to have. So it's as if we're stepping back, hands off, just notice a couple of breaths. Notice the state of your body. See so if you can maintain this inner awareness when you open your eyes. Maybe you can sense where your breath is as your eyes are open. sit down whenever you like, but this little aspect of recognition of what changed sometimes is more obvious when we stand up after we've been practicing. Breath doing that. 
And I found that rather delightful. Because there is, I've had experience, not of Coleman Lander, but um, being able to see, kind of see inside areas of my body that were light and areas of my body that were dark and inaccessible. That both. Um, but there's also the aspect of the illuminated mind. You know, and one interesting um, experience that I think all of us can have is that sometimes when we quote unquote, okay, this is a metaphor, look around inside, you may not see, oh, this is my heart, or this is my lung, or this is my kidney. But it's an intuitive sense of being able to visit around in your body, walk around, look around. It's almost like you're uh, walking around your house. It doesn't have to be um, illustrated like I actually see, oh, there's a chair over here. You can, but some people can see things like that. It can be quite abstract, quite uh, like color, or light, or shadow, or just a feeling. Um, but oftentimes when we try to look inside our bodies, you know, with a Coleman lantern, and the lantern's not on. <laughs> and so what I liken it to is walking into a room of your house, your home, and it's dark, you haven't turned the light on yet, and if you sit there, if you sustain attention, not expecting anything, but just rest in a particular area of your body, rest your awareness there, your mindfulness, your kind attention. Eventually, it's as if your eyes adjust. Now again, it may not like be turning on a light, you know, I see those books over there, or dust in the corner, although it can be for some. But it's more like, oh, a connection. This is inside. So, he talks about breath also as, um, well anyway, so I thought, I thought I'd share that with you because a lot of times we think, you know, maybe this, these kinds of practices aren't practiced in the inside of the Theravada tradition. They are. You just have to look to find them a little bit more. He talks about breath, uh, he's, he's quite amusing actually, um, was. He says, knowing how to adjust the breath and putting it in good order is tantamount to putting the mind in good order as well, as well, and can give all kinds of benefits. Now, first of all, we think that mindfulness of the breath is just watching it, just witnessing it, just observing it. Yes, it is. But there's the aspect of breath that's chitta, or that's energy, prana, or wind, that we want to pay just as much attention to. Because when we quell the winds, when we balance chitta, when we send our breath different places, and, and actually eventually soothe the nervous system, we're preparing ourselves to be with what is. So sometimes that's a skillful means that's incredibly helpful. We're sitting and the, you know, the mind is a little bit all over the place. You know what I mean? If you did some particular kinds of breathing, and there's different kinds of breathing. I mean, what I talked you through were just a couple of suggestions. But um, then it changes the inner landscape. And we can settle a little more if there's more space. If there's more space, then we can see. When things are tight, we don't see very much. We, you know, contraction does not provide much light inside, <laughs> nor does it provide any comfort, nor does it provide any understanding. It's a repellent. So bringing in the breath via the space that it's in, you know, you can imagine breathing in space, can be quite helpful, especially if you start moving it around where you need it. Um, so then he goes on to say, like a good cook who knows how to vary the food he serves, sometimes changing the color, sometimes changing the flavor, sometimes the shape, so that her employer will never grow tired of her cooking. How do we keep ourselves interested? 
could be another way of looking at it. I think, it's, I think that's great. If she fixes the same thing all year round, porridge today, porridge tomorrow, porridge the next day, her employer is bound to go looking for a new cook. But if she knows how to vary her options so that her employer is always satisfied, she's sure to get a raise in her salary or maybe a special bonus. So, you know, he's going to dry some of your um, So he's, then he goes on with the breath. You know, so it is with the breath. If you know how to adjust, and vary the breath, um, then you become thoroughly mindful and expert in all matters dealing with the breath and the other elements of the body. So it, it, I think it's partially why the Buddha emphasized breath as the key to so, to so much understanding, to so much nuanced recognition, because it's so subtle. Um, he says, you'll always know how things are going with the body. So we can pay attention to sensations. Yeah, that's really important. And really get to know the entire length of the body. We can also get to know sensations via breath, because breath is just a culmination of sensations. Right? So that he talks about, we'll get to know how Things are going in the body, and the body will be refreshed and the mind content. Both body and mind will be at peace. All the elements will be at peace, free from unrest and disturbances. So he's giving us permission to work with our nervous system. He's suggesting that we guide the breath once we start to get to know it. And he talks in the books on, you know, lots of um, transcripts of him talking about this kind of thing. But as we get to know, well, this might be better for me today or right now, and experiment, soothe. That's not bypassing. Soothe, regulate, address. So for instance, when I said, you know, um, move the breath anywhere you want, that's addressing something that might be beneficial for you. You feel a contraction, and you imagine that you're breathing there, you can release it. Maybe not the first time you try it, maybe not the second, but you definitely can. I know this to be true, and I've taught lots of people to do it. So I want to bring this in so that you are, it's a, these are different ways to take care of ourselves. It's all just non-harming. It's just not exactly sitting and just tolerating discomfort. Although we want to learn to do that too. That's very, very important. But this helps us learn to tolerate discomfort. Because when we can relax and we're not all uptight, when the nervous system is a little bit more relaxed, when the heart, mind, body is a little bit softer, then we have this spaciousness to allow things to come and go, not come, get caught, get repeated and repeated and repeated until it becomes a condition, physical condition, condition, a mental condition, an emotional condition, all of it. So I'll bring in these experts. Bringing in science. The science says, these experts say, um, there's a wonderful Zen teacher in our area, uh, we were in, named Norman Fisher. He's a great writer. If you've ever not read him, he's a great teacher. He's a really cool person, I think. But he wrote a book called um, the world could be otherwise. Um, um, imagination is the body, Bodhisattva path. I think a great book. And what we are doing a little bit is we're, we're 
walking into a little bit of imagination. I mean, there's a lot more we could do, but just for the time we have today, we're reducing it just a tiny bit. Because what we imagine creates a physiological change in response. So remember that. What you imagine creates a physiological response. Now, the magnitude of it, or the subtlety of it, who knows? But it's possible. It, it's possible. And this is something I've experienced too, having worked in the body that was a while for a really long time. So, in, Norman Fisher says, mind, and then in parentheses, as I mean it in this book, is more than intellect. It also includes sensations, emotions, subtle senses of subjectivity, desires, aspirations, attitudes, images, concepts, perceptions, and so on. In a word, mind is consciousness, the sum total of our human experience. In this sense, mind also includes body. We are conscious of our bodily sensations and of our emotions, maybe our thoughts too. They all affect us bodily and vice versa. So, can't be with one aspect of ourselves without including all of ourselves. But what he's pointing towards, I think, is that mind is heart mind, mind is body mind, mind is consciousness of, aware of itself, it's all sorts of different things. It's not rigidly or tightly delineated. And so in order to, in the book, what he, a lot of what he talks about is in order to become or be a bodhisattva, someone that really wants to postpone their own enlightenment, takes it out to do this, postpone their own enlightenment, and help people as long as they're, or help beings, sentient beings, as long as they're suffering anywhere. They come back to this uh, realm, let's say, and give up their own enlightenment and our service, um, are compassionately active. Um, and in order to be a bodhisattva, you know, to whatever scale or degree, I think it's interesting. You have to imagine that the world could be different than it is. That's what, hence his title, The World Could Be Otherwise. So we imagine that we can change things internally. It gives us agency, and then also eventually it will. And maybe not as radically as we might hope, you know, because we know what hopes do sometimes. They, they, uh, they have tentacles of expectation. <laughs> so let, let, let go of expectation. Hope without attachment is a very beautiful thing. So, imagining breath, imagining moving the breath, moving space, these are all different ways to, uh, to ease the heart, really. To ease the heart. And when the heart is more relaxed, more liberated, then everything changes. Everything changes. So we're going to read one more thing from Ajahn Suchito. He said that chitta, the heart mind. So some people uh, translate chitta as heart. Some people ch translate it as heart mind. Um, I think it to you. But chitta perceives, experiences moods and feelings, runs, reacts, gets agitated and stirred. And this is a little bit like the question that was asked about emotions. Um, it can also experience loving kindness, gratitude, determination. It can know itself. It can calm and clear. This is the one we have to get on its feet, encourage it, and then start grooming it. Start by accepting it as it is. The most direct way to do this is in your body. Feel the agitation and the stirrings. Accept the presence of that. Because the body is much more open to change than your personality. Your personality likes the idea of change, but generally wants to change for the better and quickly. It doesn't want the growing and learning process. Direct participation in the learning process makes us humble. 
We're as sane as we can be right now. So that I, it could be a broader definition for you of chitta, which I think we can embrace. Um, are there any thoughts or questions before I go on? Anything about the experience of the <coughs> practice? about breathing, I certainly was taught to kind of witness the breath as if it's something that is happening, but you're not directing it, and what you're suggesting is a little different, which kind of makes sense, because as you contract and expand your lungs, you're forcing breath out, so you're, you're involved in creating the breath in some sense. You can be. But, yeah. but what occurred to me, if, if you equate it with wind, is kind of the way sails work on a ship. Mm -hmm. So the, the boat doesn't create the wind, but right. if you're skillful, um, there are ways to effectively harness, harness the wind. wind. Yeah. And maybe that's somewhat related to what you're saying. Yeah. I mean, you're using it to uh -huh. stay healthy and have a relationship with your body, but. I was just thinking about the connection between wind and breath and, yeah. and the concept of sails. Right, I love that. Um, that's a, a good metaphor, a good image. The, um, in the Tibetan, a lot of the Tibetan traditions, breath is called wind or lung. And they use lung, they use wind, they use breath differently than, than we do, but it's part of the medical system. It's part of now, I want to just be careful about talking about healing because we all have different ideas of what healing is. But <coughs> the, the wind or the breath, or the, it's called prana and it's called chi, are all aspects of consciousness. And it's another way to work with the mind. And so, when, for instance, when wind or breath is is um, is kicked up high, which was some mentioned a tiny bit in the beginning. When the winds are up high in the body or in the throat, they disturb the mind. So it's like a hurricane. When the winds are settled lower in the body, below the navel, we literally feel the earth. We're present and we're cold. Those are just two examples of wind, breath, prana, chi, boom, it's called, that we can um, learn to work with. So a lot of the disturbances in, te in Tibetan medicine is, is, is the wind. It's the wind that's making the disturbances in the body. So that means it's the mind that's making the disturbance in the body. Now, I would say, maybe not completely. That's my own humble opinion. Because in the environment that we live in on this planet right now, there's a lot of pollutants, there's lots of plastics, there's lots of things that um, we can't settle with, you know, that enter into our body and cause lots of different things. You know, there are accidents. There's genetics involved. So I, I'm a little careful about that myself. Right? And I don't want to present this as a way that you can you know, cure something. But we could liberate the heart with it. And in a way, that is curing. Because when the heart is free, everything's different. So the aspect of wind and directing it, like you're imagining it in a sail, is really good. Because you can, and what we're doing is we're just directing our awareness. Now that's not something we want to do all the time. Because we want to be able to observe the breath just as it is. Because observing the breath or the body just as it is, 
It's telling us what's going on. So we're not constantly trying to fix or change it without information. Does that make sense? I think that's really critical. Because otherwise, it's just, you know, we're not seeing things as they are. You know, we're just like, oh, I don't like this, and just change it. We need to be able to see things as they are, and then take care of ourselves, and then see how things are. You know, so it's, it's going to be in a, maybe a different order for all of us, but that's part of the potential of what we, what we did. Um, thank you. You had a question or a thought? Something, an observation that I have between the two practices is even though we kind of went through similar sense doors as the first practice, yeah. it's kind of almost like a metaphorical leaning back. Like for example, with the eyes, like the eyes kind of yeah. like sinking back or the tongue is sinking. So each of the sense stores were kind of like, it felt like it was a leaning back, relaxation, and opening. Yeah. And the second practice is kind of like, it, like kind of like the, the floodlight, like a wider awareness. And the second practice is more of like leaning in to like the, the light behind my eyelids and like listening to the sound. So like it had a very different activation, like uh -huh. that was like subtle. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I just found that kind of fascinating. In some ways, we're exploring the same body parts, but at a very different yeah. energy to it. I agree. Right, and this is where experimentation comes in. Because like, what would be the best thing for you to do this morning, or after work, or after an argument, or before an argument? <laughs> you know, like just take practical examples, right? Or, you know, yeah with life. So that's why, you know, there's not one way to do things, but what works for us is the way to do things. And, and that'll change, you know, and that what works for us isn't going to stay the same every day or throughout our lives because we're changing all the time. But to have that freedom, you know, that permission to experiment or play around is really, really, really important. I mean, all traditions do that to an extent, some less than others. But what we're encouraged to do in the beginning, and it makes a lot of sense, is follow the breath as it is, witness. Witness the mind, witness the heart, witness the body. Know that what we're wit witnessing is not us. We are not what we're witnessing. Awareness is not what awareness is. Oh, uh, wait, sorry. Awareness isn't what awareness is of. That's very, very important to really recognize. And as we develop as practitioners, as spiritual practitioners, and as we emotionally, intelligently develop, which I think happens organically because we're watching our own mind, we're sensing our heart, we're getting to know our own bodies, then we can experiment a little more. And it's not taking us off the track, it's keeping us on the track. Hopefully that makes a little sense. There's a, well, there's a wonderful teacher, uh, Zen teacher named Uchiyami, Uchiyama Roshi, Roshi, excuse me. And he wrote a book, a really interesting book, called Opening the Hand of Thought. And he says, um, Thinking means to be grasping or holding on to something with our brain's conceptual hand. But if we open it, if we don't conceive, what is in our hand falls away. Our true self also includes that which lets go. So when we control the body, when we tighten the breath, when we, when the breath, we're not doing it consciously, but when the breath gets pushed up high, that's like taking the hand and tightening it. And so the, the conceptual hand, the brain's conceptual hand is our entire body and includes our breath. 
So that's how we can start to watch and sense and feel and really become intimate with and get to know how our body is responding to our thoughts and feelings, how our thoughts and feelings are responding to our body. And the same goes with breath. And it's a, a different portal into being more conscious, more awake, more aware, more open, more connected. Because remember, when we're tight, we're body, heart, mind, we're not connected. We're not connected. Clinging does not connect us. Attachment does not connect us, but spaciousness does. Spaciousness connects us. Everything is in space. I found that quote really helpful, as you can picture it. Um, Franz Fanon was a uh, West Indian psychiatrist and philosopher, maybe some of you have heard of him. And um, he, he says that bodies, or said that bodies are the lived side of the meaning. And again, this is the aspect, the phenomenological aspect of um, awareness, the relative and the absolute. The relative awareness is uh, you know, from our perspective. Gotta have it. Just to get along somewhat. But we can hold it lightly. And the body is the lived side of um, meaning. Um, and I, I like to parallel the lived side of meaning with a house. You know, how we live in our bodies is, you know, kind of like how we live in our house. There are areas that we don't go in. There's some that are too crowded, you know, some rooms are too crowded, some drawers are too stuffed, you know. To tidy up some places. We have different memories in our bodies. So, um, getting to know the body will take a little time, but once we connect it, once we take the colon lantern in, or the breath, or just soften, then we become more and more in, really, literally embodied, connected to ourselves and connected to the earth, which really means everything, I think. So having these two views, relative and absolute, are important because they coexist. They co-arise, they coexist. You know, nothing is one way. Nothing is really linear, which I like. Um, it, it, holds, it holds space for lots of different things to occur. If something's supposed to happen like this and this and this, oh, it's kind of a rigid system. <laughs> Blake in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell says, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear as it is. So we want to get to know um, what it's like to look through a glass of some sort. <laughs> like rose-colored glasses would be the typical metaphor. Um, we want to get to know our own perceptions and how they show up and where they stop us in our tracks and where they propel us into harm. Again, harm, small h harm. Like always doing the same damn thing over and over and over again, even though we know it's not helpful. And we do that in relatively minor ways, and we do that in sometimes you know, hurtful ways to ourselves. Like being self-critical is harmful. So if we can catch, for instance, when the body starts to change or shift a little bit, or the breath starts to change and shift, because of a critical voice that's in our mind, then we can stop it. And if we 
put a pause or a stop over and over and over again into a conditioned pattern, it loses its strength. So rather than thinking, oh, I gotta stop saying that, I have to stop saying that, I gotta stop saying that, I gotta be nicer to myself. What we can do is we can approach it through the body as well. I mean, it doesn't have, it's not mutually exclusive. So feel the tension in the body, feel the tightening in the body, feel the tension in the breath and change it there, and then do it again, and then do it again. At least address it consciously with some tenderness, with uh, breath, which is prana, life force, which is chi, which is energy, which is gung, which is wind, and breeze, you know, however you want to think of it. It's like that. So, yeah, the sense, the expression of thoughts and emotions in the body. And we also want to have some um, skillful means to work with what we see, work, work with what we feel, work with ourselves in the most kind way possible. Any questions? We'll finish with a little practice, but are there any? Questions, thoughts, anybody online? Um, hearing that music earlier reminded me of living in New York City when I used to teach there. First, I thought, how can anyone practice meditation? It's so loud, there you know, like people screaming and partying, and, and it was just like, why not? <laughs> and I had a Tibetan teacher that used to come and stay with me for periods of time in New York. And um, once in a while, I'd hear him leave in the middle of the night, kind of early in the morning, three o'clock or something. And then, you know, he would leave and come back by, I don't know, six, seven, I don't remember. And one day I said, maybe she, well, what are you, where are you going? And he said, oh, I'm going to um, um, Times Square. in the middle of the night. Now here's this very trusting Tibetan Lama. <laughs> and he has his, you know, maroon robe, but he has a little, little yellow shirt, right? Which generally is kind of secure, it's very thin, with a pocket on his chest. And the pocket has a wad of cash in it. <laughs> so it always kind of stuck out. You could see that he had this like wad of dollars. You might not want to do that in New York. But he said, oh, it's a... well, anyway, he'd go to Times Square like that. And I said, well, what are you doing going to Times Square? I said, I'm just practicing. You should try it. He said, there's so much going on. It's really wonderful. I was like, OK. Uh, and I did, actually. I did go a few times early in the morning when people were there. I wasn't going to go at night when it wasn't as crowded or when people were you know, really wasted. But <laughs> in the morning, I went up, took a piece of cardboard, and I practiced. And someone got wind of it, and they asked if I would write a little bit about it, or they could interview me. And they sent, yeah, I said, sure. So they sent a photographer. If you ever get on my website, you can see this picture. And I was on a subway grate. And the subway comes on under me, and my clothes go whoop. 
and the photographer is like, great, let it go, yay, you know, so anyway, it was an interesting moment, but what I found, <laughs> meditating with someone trying to take my picture was odd, but, you know, kind of didn't really need to bother me so much, but what I found was in the chaos of Times Square that I was really quiet. I don't know if any of you ever find that. So sometimes we need like absolute pin drop quiet, and sometimes it's in some chaos or a lot of movement or sound or noise or activity that we can be also find this incredible stillness. Incredible stillness. John Charles says, still, still flowing water. There's stillness in the flowing water. So things co arise, coexist. Um, Yeah. So Mark Epstein is a friend of mine, a Buddhist psychologist. He says, psychiatrist, excuse me. This is a spiritual path means making a path rather than following one. So let's make ours within reason, you know, um, following the guidance of, of uh, our spiritual friends, not necessarily taking word for granted or you know, this is the way things are, but being in a spiritual community where we can be on a path, our own individual path and a path collectively, is really, really important. It's really important. We remind each other to come back on the path. We remind each other, you know, to maybe be a little easier on yourself here and there. Or we remind each other, you know what, I heard this great teaching, you know, maybe this would be interesting for you. Things like that. Remind each other of our own goodness. That's the connection part of Sangha, of spiritual friends, Kalyanamita. That is uh, in spiritual life, the Buddha taught the whole of spiritual life. The most important aspect. So I really appreciate being here with you. And um, it's just two short little and So sort of like when we allow the eyes to sink in towards the back of the skull, you can try looking at the base of your skull, acting like you can or imagining that you can. This is also a Dzogchen practice. You can notice how that might feel. But we can also imagine that we're turning our eyes to look at our heart or the heart center. And we can notice how that feels. And we can also notice what it might be like to turn our eyes towards our belly below the navel. sense that. So we can direct our inner gaze somewhere that might be helpful. It's concentration, it's mindfulness. It's a skillful means. linger and spend a little time in one of those places or any place really in the body to help us find some balance or a refuge. Some inner sanity. Even if it's just for a short time.
he's through the invitation. No. Um, if you, I send out a really erratic email. It was another thing. Um, if you want to be on my mailing list, I'd be happy to take your name. Um, I'm in Berkeley, and I do a lot of things online. See you again. And um, I hope that some of this information will be useful for you in your daily life.